Hey, welcome to Soul Cafe. Glad you're here with us tonight. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But before you get there tonight, we want to say welcome to Soul Cafe. If this is your first time with us, this is an opportunity for you to get some spiritual food in the middle of the week to get through the week so you can celebrate with us on Sunday or wherever you may be worshiping uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, we're going to jump in today at looking at diffusing the dynamite in relationships. And Peter's been talking about, if you were with us last week, we talked about men and women. Today we're going to be talking about relationships generically. But here's a question I want to give you. It's sort of a trivia fact. See how you do on it. The two largest age groups in America that buy baby food. Can you get it? Well, you probably figured out the first one pretty easily, parents of babies, of course. Second biggest demographic, though, is senior adults. Isn't it amazing we kind of revert back a lot of times to the way we used to be? And this is what Peter and the writer of Hebrews are going to talk about tonight, about not reverting back. In fact, if you hold your finger in 1 Peter chapter 3 and look in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews begins to give us an admonition. And he says to us in verse 1, Therefore, let us move beyond, listen to this, the elementary teachings about Christ. How many of you have met people that have been Christians 40, 50, 60 years, but they're still like they're in kindergarten when it comes to the Bible? Uh, they really don't know the Bible. Uh, they may be nice church people, but they just don't know much about their spiritual life. They've never moved on. They've never, they're still eating baby food. And Hebrews 6 tells us to move on beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Now, what things are we supposed to move on from? He gives us five or six areas. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, of faith in God, so our faith ought to be pretty strong by the time we've been a Christian any length of time. Instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, verse 2, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So what the writer is saying in Hebrews is he's saying just, guys, look, it's time to get beyond the elementary stuff you learn in kindergarten. It's time to move on to the deeper things of God. And one of the evidences, practically speaking, that we are growing up, that we have moved on, that we are mature followers, is not your position in the church. It's not how long you've been a member of a church. It's not the level of your biblical knowledge. The key indicator of maturity is how do you handle your relationships? Let's look at it tonight. 1 Peter chapter 3. If you need an outline, they're at fbcde.com. You can pull those out, follow along with us, fill in the blanks. Man, so glad you're with us tonight. Verse 8 says this, finally... Now, Peter's not done with the book yet. He's only a little over halfway done. But like Paul, a lot of times they would say, finally. What they're saying is, to sum up, what he's been telling us in chapter 2 about submitting to authority politically, submitting to those over us in our job, submitting to one another in marriage. Now he's going to talk to us about submitting to our overall relationships that we're involved in. So in summing up, in all these areas, he's going to begin to tell us some key indicators, so let's just call these mile markers in our road to spiritual maturity in terms of relationships. And he gives us the first maturity milestone, and that is unity. Unity. In fact, he uses the word in verse 8, finally, all of you be like-minded. Now, this doesn't mean we all think the same, or we all believe the same way, or that we all look at life from the same perspective. You put two Baptists together, they're going to argue about something. <laughs> you, you put two or three people together that have a different view politically or economically, even religiously, they're going to find some points of difference. So the Bible is not telling us that we have to all believe the same thing, unless it's the core elements of the, of the faith. But what it's saying is, literally, this word, like-minded, means to be of the same purpose. The reason that we have church, the reason that we are a church family, we ought to have one. Per I tell people all the time, I say, look, here's the thing. You don't have to like all the music. You don't have to enjoy all the sermons. I hope you do, though. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to even just like all the programs that we offer, the way that we do things, or the selection of the things that we offer in our buffet of ministry. But what you have to do is believe in the same purpose, to be a good, unified member of our church body, our family. You have to be here for the right 
purpose. And that's what Peter is trying to say. He's saying, look, guys, in this whole idea of being like-minded, which incidentally is the only time this word is used in the New Testament, it's right here. Be of similar purpose. Have the right purpose. Don't get, don't get, de don't de deconstruct into petty things. You say, what are petty things? Well, today it's politics. It's wearing masks or not wearing masks. Getting vaccinated, not vaccinated. Uh, you know, looking at a particular scripture passage that we've always disagreed upon and, you know, making our stand. I, they will, I will not be moved. What, it, what he's talking about is this. He's saying, when it comes down to things, when you argue about endless, unimportant, insignificant things that really don't matter, you need to come down to one thing, and that is a singleness of mind when it comes to your purpose. That's how you maintain strong relationships. In fact, a, a marriage cannot uh, really grow and thrive unless it has understanding, unless it has information, unless it has reconciliation. These are the things that make for strong marriages, that make for strong relationships. So the first thing is be of the same purpose. Be here for the right reason. Know the Some of you are watching from other churches. What's the purpose of your church? Why do they gather? If I ask my people, you know, what's the purpose of this church? And they say, well, to have Sunday services, wrong. <laughs> or, or, you know, to, to preach the gospel, wrong. You don't need a church building to do that. Or, or to do missions, wrong. The purpose of the church is to fulfill the Great Commission, to get the word out about Jesus Christ and invite people to receive him as their personal savior. That is the only, that's the only valid reason you're part of this church. And if we ever disagree about that, we are no longer a unified church. So keep that in mind when, and lay aside all the petty stuff. It really doesn't matter. Here's the second thing, a ministry milestone. How are you doing in the first one, incidentally? Here's the second one, mutual interest, mutual interest. In fact, he says the next word, be sympathetic. It means to feel with. It refers to the absence of envy and jealousy and competition and comparison. It means to affirm or validate a person's feelings about something. I mean, if you're in a relationship marriage-wise, you know that you have to validate the other person's feelings. You, you may not agree with them. You may not like their feelings. You may disagree with their feelings, but you better validate that that's the way they feel. <laughs> I was in a meeting this morning about trying to reconcile a relationship with someone who uh, was at odds with uh, uh, things that are going on and so it really just came down to one thing. It came down to this, and that is this very word. I listened to their feelings, they listened to mine, and we agreed to work on the same purpose. We walked out of that, shaking hands, loving on one another. That's the way we maintain good relationships. That's what mature people do. Now, immature people, what do they do? They back up. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm not going to give in. If they get right, then I'll get right. <laughs> and we put all these barriers up to reconciliation. That is the immature way to live the Christian life. Peter is saying, if you really want to know, are you mature? It's this. Are you living in reconciled relationships with other people? Now, there are some relationships, hopefully not very many, that you're never going to reconcile with. The other person refuses to do so. The other person is, uh, is unrepentant. And in those situations, the Bible just gives us this advice. Be at peace with them the best that you can. But guys, 95% of our relationships, if we will simply validate the way that a person feels, I understand how you feel, and I choose to love you. I choose to bear with you. I choose to get under your burden and walk with you in carrying that burden uh, down, the, down the life of the spiritual journey. So we all have a need to be understood. Here's the third thing, guys, that we need to understand in the way of spiritual maturity, these mile markers, and that is the next word. He says, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, and be compassionate. Uh, this, this word love it's really the word Philadelphia, it's which we get our word Philadelphia. That's only about 25, 30 miles from the church. And it means brotherly love. We call that the city of brotherly love. This word means brotherly affection. In fact, Calvin, who's one of the great reformers, said this, where God is known as father, there and only there, true brotherhood really exists. Only as we accept God as our father, Jesus as our savior, the Holy Spirit as our empowerment, as only as we validate the role of the Trinity in our life do we really have right relationships with other, with other, other people. In fact, here, here's something for you. If you don't have a right relationship with someone, you need to first check your relationship with God. Because when you're walking with God, the Bible says in Proverbs, he'll make even your enemies to be at peace with you. 
And that's a powerful verse, folks. So friendship and affection. You say, what does friendship and affection mean? What does brotherly love mean? It means this, one word, loyalty. I am committed to you. You may fail me. You may walk away from me. We may disagree over an issue like Paul and Barnabas did over using John Mark in ministry. Uh, We may get eye to eye and just say that we are total opposites, but I choose to be loyal to you. I'm loyal to who you are, your calling in life, your ministry. I'm loyal. In, In the church setting, we would say this, I'm loyal to my church family. That means I'm committed to them. I don't necessarily agree. I don't like everything. People rub me the wrong way, but I'm committed. I am not going to leave my family. That's what it means to be in brotherly love with other people. In fact, Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted, that means totally committed to one another in brotherly love. Now we're going to fight like cats and dogs. <laughs> we're, 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 going to, we're going to just like, ooh, you know, get irritable about uh, with each other at times. But, but man, making up. Setting aside our own selfishness, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, and choosing to reconcile is the most powerful indicator of maturity. I know when Pat and I sometimes get in a disagreement when the kids, especially when the kids were younger, and they'd see us arguing or they'd hear us, our voices a little loud, we try to afterwards have them see us, you know, reconciling with one another, uh, hugging each other, making sure that they saw just like we had argued. We knew how to reconcile. In fact, one day I remember Chris, and she was probably maybe seven or eight years old, uh, old, and we were hugging one another in the kitchen. She goes to Joel and Melanie, they're at it again. <laughs> and so, but I wanted our kids to see that reconciliation is just as important as arguing. It's just as important as being irritable with one another. If they see us at our worst, I want them to see us at, at their best. So the word brotherly love. Here's the fourth word, compassion, compassion is the fourth characteristic ministry milestone. And uh, if you skip down to uh, uh, be compassionate and humble with one another, that's what Peter's saying, but it really leads into verse nine, which says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing because to this you were called that you may inherit a blessing. <clears throat> in other words, what compassion means is this. Compassion is love in action. It means I intentionally move towards you with love. I I was telling somebody the other day, I said, I know this person is driving you crazy. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, In fact, their whole life mission may be to poke you in the eye, but I want you to bless them. I want you to sow a treasure into their life. I want you to do the unexpected because they're expecting you to come at them with fist up, you know, and words and and, and, an adversarial position. Why don't you sow a blessing into their life? And do that continually until God begins to soften their heart. Man, just arguing and getting upset with one another and posting on Facebook that this person did me wrong, that just creates conflict. That just deteriorates the relationship. But when I choose to do an act of love in action, it's what Ephesians 4.29, which it says, speak only that which builds up according to each person's needs that may benefit the listener. When I choose to use words that build you up rather than blast you, it indicates I'm mature. But if I'm blasting, if I'm criticizing, if I'm negative, if I'm just being a person that is constantly pointing out what's wrong in life or what's wrong with you in life, then I haven't achieved maturity in life. Let's look at the fifth thing, and that is humility. Humility, again, the end of verse 8, be uh, love one another, be compassionate, and humble. Now, 1 Corinthians puts it this way, love is not proud. Proverbs 13, 10 says, pride only leads to arguments. What does it mean to be humble? It means this. I am humble enough to say to you, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Some of the most powerful words of the English language is, please forgive me, or I forgive you. That when I get up on me, when I get, when I get my, my nose up and, and I say, hey, I'm right and this person is wrong, and I'm going to show them how wrong they were, <laughs> I'm demonstrating a baby attitude. I'm living in immaturity. The mature life is one that says, look, I've made a mistake please forgive me. Or it says to a person, it seems like you have something against me. Man, have I offended you in some way? And if they say yes and they describe it, then ask their forgiveness. You may not even agree that you did that, but ask their forgiveness. Because again, you're validating how they feel, not necessarily reality. Proverbs 28, 13 says, anyone who refuses to admit their mistakes can never be successful, but he confesses and forsakes them. He gets another chance. Man, when you forgive or you ask forgiveness, it's like resetting the tile. It means, it means you, you come back to a place where there is just a you know push the button, reset, and the whole relationship starts over again 
hopefully on a good nature. I also think about this when I think of humility, about a story about Walter who worked for the largest corporation in the world. This is sort of a make-believe story, but but uh, the personnel uh, person that hired Walter said, you're going to start like everybody else. You're going to start in the mail room. So that's where he was. He worked there for years. He never moved up. And he was very frustrated at that because he knew he could do more. And one day he was about to step on a cockroach he saw scurrying across the floor. And in this uh, proverbial story, the make-believe story, the cockroach Milton said to him, please don't kill me. I'll grant you any wishes that you want. And Walter said, well, that's great. I no longer want to work in the mailroom. I want to be vice president of this corporation. Boom, the wish was granted. Next day, he's vice president of the corporation. In fact, the cockroach continued to grant him wishes. And eventually, he was the CEO of the largest corporation in the world. And he said to himself, I am Walter. Everybody reports to me. Everybody bows down to me. I'm the most important person in the world. Until he heard somebody praying out on the deck. He went out there, and they were praying to God. So we went back to Milton the cockroach, and he said, uh, hey, that guy's praying not to Walter. He's praying to God. I want to be God. The next day, Walter was back in the mailroom. Because where do we start in leadership? We start at the bottom. Where do we begin in our accent to climbing the ladder of spiritual maturity and success? We start at the very, begon- at the very bottom. That is the word humility. Here's the next word, number six forgiveness. We see this again, verse 9. We read that just a moment ago. Don't repay evil with evil but or insult with insult, but on the contrary, repay evil with a blessing so that you may inherit a blessing. People say all the time to me, I, I just need the Lord to bless me. Then bless those people that are misusing you. Bless those people that are speaking against you. Bless those people that are not treating you the right way. Bless those people that are ignoring you. Bless those people that have evil intent against you. It makes no sense to do that. But when you return a blessing, when you've been insulted, you get a blessing in return. If you return an insult with an insult, guess what you inherit from God? (laughs) An insult. You miss your blessing. Your, Your blessing is delayed. Your blessing is detoured. You don't get your blessing when somebody insults you and you return it with another insult. Forgiveness is releasing that which somebody has done against us. It doesn't mean that we feel good about it. It doesn't mean that they're getting off the hook. In fact, forgiveness is never about the other person that's offended you. It's about you. Because the only way you can stay spiritually healthy is when you forgive another person. I remember reading a story about World War II when uh, Rome was taken over and the SS, German uh, SS was there uh, occupying Rome. Colonel Hermann Knappler was uh, the head of the SS and he was rounding up Jews even though he demanded a multi-million dollar ransom uh, from uh, Pope Pius at that time and the chief rabbi of the city and they gathered all the money together and paid Napper off. He still herded all the Jews that that he could find in Rome and took them to the concentration camp. He also was a man that would just routinely pull people out of their homes and torture them, even execute them without reason. One day a bomb blew up about 30 people. There was a bomb planted by the Communist Party in Italy and to retaliate he took 300 civilian people and he put them at the mouth of a cave and shot every one of them and then blew up the entrance to the cave where the bodies had been placed and sealed it shut. I mean, he, this guy was brutal. He was horrific. But the one guy he could never find, the one guy that just drove him absolutely crazy was Hugh O'Flattery. He was a, he was a cardinal in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, and this guy just absolutely was the sand spur in the foot, in the sandal of Napler. I mean, he, he, was, he was constantly trying to capture him. He was always looking for him because uh, Monsieur Hugh O'Flattery was taking allied POWs that escaped the POW camps and, and Jews and secretly getting them out of Rome into a, into a safe place. And so Napler's sole mission became capturing O'Flattery. In fact, at one point he had surrounded a home. He knew that, uh, that uh, Hugh O'Flattery was in there. Hugh O'Flattery, being a pretty ingenious guy, noticed that the pieces of coal, back in those days they heated homes and buildings with coal, and they had these coal chutes, and, and so he rubbed, he took off his outer cloak and his, his white collar, and he rubbed himself all with coal and all over his uh, uh, uniform, and he put his uh, uh, Catholic priest uniform into a coal sack, and he flung it over there, and he slid down the coal chute. It pushed him out into the courtyard, and there were other coal men there that were, that were collecting the coal to put into the furnace to burn for heat, and, and he mixed in with them, and he was able to escape right under the noses of the SS troops. This just throws Napper absolutely over the edge. Well, Napper never, ever captured him. Napper, though, himself was captured, and he was led to a war tribunal court where a sentence was pronounced, life imprisonment, 
for the crime of killing those 300 civilians. He lived for many, many years after World War II. He only had one visitor in his entire life. Once a month for like 12, 13 years after the war, one person showed up monthly to visit him, Monsieur Hugh O'Flattery, who after 12 years finally led Herman Knappler to Jesus Christ and baptized him. Can you imagine if O'Flattery would have just said, this guy doesn't deserve anything. This guy, I, I want to see him burn. I, I, I want to see this guy go to hell. I, I just, this guy has killed so many innocent people. But instead, he led him to Jesus because he chose to forgive. Who do you need to forgive right now? Who in your life, whether it's a big thing or a small thing, you just need to release it and let God have it. Who in your life right now that has hurt you, harmed you, done something wrong, not done something they said they were going to do? Who has abused you or hurt you or, or swung verbal barrages of bombs and arrows at you that you just need to say, you know, I'm releasing you from my personal judgment. I'm putting you in the hands of God. I'm not going to let this destroy my spiritual life. One of the mile markers of maturity is always forgiveness. Here's the uh, seventh thing, and we're almost done, guys. We're looking at verse 10 in tonight's lesson. And that is tongue control, tongue control. Verse 10 says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Tongue control. In fact, one, James puts it this way. How do you know if you've got good religion? How do you know if you're a religious person? You control your tongue. <laughs> you watch what you say. You choose your words carefully. You muzzle your mouth. You, you control your reactions. In fact, Proverbs 12, 18 says, Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wise spoken words can heal. I remember that little thing that used to say, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Whoever wrote that was an idiot. <laughs> Words do hurt. Words do go deep. Words do hurt our soul. Words disturb our spirit. Words wound us. I, I, I can remember things that teachers and others said to me early in life that were negative and that could have just kept me in, in a box and I would have never gotten out of it because of their perceptions of me as a child growing up. But I chose to move beyond their words. I, I choose not to come back at them. And what Peter is saying is this. One of the key Issues in life to remember is this. If you will control your tongue, you've achieved spiritual maturity. Let's look at this last one tonight. It's verses 11 and 12 where Peter writes, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. This is number eight on your outline, purity in peace. Purity in peace. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. What is Peter saying? He said, man, if you want to love life, if you want to be considered spiritually mature, if you really want to know you are a person that is walking in truth, a true, mature Christ follower, it's not how much you know. It's not your position in the church. It's not some achievement that you've done in the religious world. It's not even being pastor of a church. I know a lot of immature pastors. I've been immature at times in my life. But the key mile marker is this. Are you walking in peace? Because you're doing the other seven mile markers that we've already mentioned tonight. Because peace is the end result of doing those seven areas, those seven mile markers. When you do them, you get peace. I wonder, do you have peace tonight? Do you have just a settled contentment in the Lord? Are you walking and living in a peaceful, restful relationship with God? You can do that if you're controlling your tongue. You can do that if you're humble. <laughs> you can do that if you're compassionate. You can do that if you're not returning an insult for an insult. You can do that. You Peace is the fruit of pursuing maturity in Jesus and living in his spirit. I wonder tonight as we pray, if you just close your eyes with me for just a moment, I wonder if you just do a quick heart, gut, wrenching check. Would you say tonight, Lord, yeah, okay, I'm not doing too good in that one area that Pastor Ron mentioned tonight. Or there's two or three areas that, oh, I need to firm up. I wonder if you would say tonight, Lord, I want to make that right. I want to move on to maturity. I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep going over the same elementary things over and over again. I want to be a mature person in you. Then make a commitment tonight to take that area 
that just needs to be sharpened up, controlling your tongue, being more compassionate, being humble, practicing brotherhood, living a selfless life. I say, God, that's what I'm going to work on this week. Help me, God, through your spirit to be strong in that area. I want to move on to maturity. Let God speak to your heart tonight. And then make the choice to be intentional to do something about that area. Lord, help us as we do. Give us the power as we move forward. Help us all to grow up into maturity. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, uh, it's so good to have you tonight, as we said just a moment ago, and uh, we've been in this series now for several weeks. If you want to go back and listen to any of them, they're on First Baptist Delaware Facebook page, YouTube page, fbcd.com, I think probably has them listed as well. Uh, usually these lessons, 20, 25 minutes, and you can get just your spiritual lift if you want to go back and listen to some of the previous messages to kind of catch up to where we're moving on. We're going to take our offering right now. We're flashing up our PowerPoint cell that will explain how to give, and again, we're focusing on outreach in our church right now, so Help us get outreach done. This is the one area that this church for uh, for probably a decade or more has sort of neglected, and we are all in right now and trying to do community outreach, but we can only do that as we get the funds to provide the support to do the outreach that we want to do. So help us out if you would this week. You can send it by check. FBCDE.com has uh, the address of the church. You can bring it in on Sunday if you want, uh, or you can give electronically as the PowerPoint slide says. We're hoping to see you again on Sunday as we just look at an incredibly new message and close out the series, This Is Us, as we look at the fear of God, how to live in the fear of God with our family members. And it's going to be a powerful message. Hope you'll be with us this Sunday at 11 or watching us at FBC Facebook or YouTube page. Guys, we'll see you next week. Have a tremendous day tomorrow. God bless you.